Sometimes when I look out into the world and I'm out and about, the Holy Spirit will open my eyes to some things that's, that are going on. You know, uh, what you see is not, what, is not always what you get. We see people going on about with their lives, happy and carefree, but a lot of times this is a, a show. This is fake. And God will still sometimes show me most of these people are not walking with him and on their way to destruction with a smile on their face. I know this isn't the most comfortable thing. I don't know, way to start a sermon by, you know, killing our spirits here. But we need to realize it. This can, and this can naturally uh, draw us, lead us, if you would, to losing heart, to despairing of the world we live in. But Jesus says some good things. He says, my child, don't lose heart. So what should we do then? He says, pray. This is his solution. Jesus says, pray. Why? Because prayer actually changes things. Prayer is the pipeline God has chosen to move through. So we pray. Look, do we live in a world of trouble? Yeah. Even if sometimes it's veiled by our nice suburban lives, we still live in a world of trouble. And when trouble hits, Jesus tells us, don't lose heart now. Pray. Pray. We have to learn to pray. It's our only outlet for peace. And Jesus died and rose from the dead so that we might have hope. Not so that we would despair. Not so that we would lose hearts. But so that we would pray and have hope. So don't lose hope in hard times. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart in hard times. That's what I meant to say. But pray. Pray. So here's what he says in Luke 18, verse 1. <clears throat> Luke tells us, And he, Jesus, told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So Jesus, if you read verse uh, chapter 17, rather, he just finished teaching about his second coming, and he had said some pretty disturbing things, to say the least. Luke 17, 33 to 37 says this, Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. <clears throat> One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, where, Lord? He said to them, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. See it? <laughs> whoa, whoa, wait a minute, Lord. Like, what? That sounds like some bad news. Lose your life and gain it. People are going to be taken and others won't. Vultures are gathering where corpses are. We can understand how you might lose heart after hearing that, right? So, Jesus follows up that teaching with a parable to the effect that they, and by extension we, should always pray and not lose heart. First of all, let's deal with this. What's a parable? What's a parable? Anybody know? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, you, some of you know. <clears throat> I'll tell you, this is what a parable is. <clears throat> um, the Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible says this, the parables of Jesus are not merely illustrations for Jesus' preaching, they are the preaching, at least to a great extent, nor are they simple stories, they have been truly described as both works of art and weapons of war. His parables have very pointed messages. He didn't just tell a parable and say, okay, Interpret it however thou wilt. You know, whatever you want it to mean, that's what it means. No, he had, a, he had an arrow and he had a bullseye and he hit it every time. An artist who makes a work of art does it for a specific reason. Unless you're like a modern artist, then you just put a bunch of paint on a canvas and sell it for a million dollars. But usually real art has a specific message. If you want to know what the artwork is trying to convey, what do you do? Well, go ask the artist. He or she is the one that did it, and they know why they did it, so ask them. And even more so with the weapon of warfare. Weapons have specific usages for a specific task. Arrows are meant to be shot by a bow, right? You wouldn't take an arrow and use it like a sword. That wouldn't make any sense. Neither would you put a bullet into a slingshot. That wouldn't do much. You put it into a gun. 
specific purposes for art and weapons. So with this parable, we get uh, uh, a little advantage because Luke tells us exactly what it means at the beginning. He says, this is what the parable is about. This parable is meant to encourage you to pray and not lose hearts. So, you know, a lot of times when we read the Bible, we want to allegorize it and go, oh, man, what does this really mean? And, uh, no, he tells you it means pray and don't lose hearts. That's what it means. So thank you, Luke, for that. My job is done. Thanks for giving. I'm going to leave now. Thanks for those who gave me pity laughs. <laughs> now, I'm just going to get real for a minute, okay? Let, let me just say this. I want to ask you, do we live in a distressful time? Do we? Is that, is that true? Do you ever think about this generation and feel distress? I have young boys, 16 months old, and I'm distressed. They can't even walk, and I'm distressed. Like, Man, wh what's going on in the world? You guys are growing up in this crazy world. Man, we need the Lord. So... We've been lulled into a very deceptive coma, though, in Canada, in our country, because we have certain freedoms, right? Uh, we have prosperity. Our neighbors smile at us, usually. Anybody have a rude neighbor? No? You do? Okay. Well, you smile at them. I know that for sure. Uh, we say sorry. We say thank you, right? And so we think, boy, everything is so great. But the fabric of our society is crumbling because behind the smiles are broken marriages, Behind the smiles are hurt children. Sin is being pushed with religious zeal by the leaders of our country's pride. The thing that God says, don't be proud. Pride will destroy you. We have a parade for it. I remember driving down the avenue one day and on my way, uh, driving down the street, I was off to a family-friendly church event, right? So as I drove, I saw one guy on the bench tripping on something, sores on his face, hot, so high he couldn't even walk. I saw another young lady strung out, lying on the concrete. I saw another guy, very masculine guy, buzz cut, beard, walking out of his apartment in a blue dress with high heels. And this thought entered my mind, man, are we in Sodom? It just, that's what I thought. I didn't mean it to be demeaning to anybody. I didn't mean to, to like... I don't say that in a disrespectful way, but just look what's going on. How can I drive down one street and see two people, like, I don't know if they were, they were really high. I don't know if they OD'd, but lying on the concrete, nobody cared. We have to get outside of our safe bubble zone and stop and look. We're in the final hours here. Now, I have to find myself in distress about this generation there's preachers getting arrested in Toronto for saying God loves you. If you want to know more about that, talk to me. I'll send you the, the article. Our brothers and sisters around the globe are being killed by Islamic extremists and godless communists. And I feel great distress and sorrow of heart because sin is ravaging people. And the people of God are being persecuted and trampled on. And many of us have to be careful what we even say at work or else we might get fired. It's a sad state of affairs when speaking the name of Jesus in a country that touts free speech can get you in trouble for hate speech. The days of distress are upon us, but I have good news. And this is the good news. Jesus has good news. He says, pray and don't lose hearts. When you see these things, don't lose hearts. Pray. Although we're greatly distressed, Jesus says, my brother, my sister, pray always and don't lose heart. Why? Because he's overcome the world. He's overcome it already. So he tells us to pray and listen to my parable. Be strengthened and pray. God will bring justice speedily. He will. So don't lose heart and pray. Verse 2 says, he, Jesus said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will, keep, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So Jesus tells a parable with two characters, a judge and a widow. He tells us a bit about the judge. This judge doesn't fear God. He doesn't respect man. He was a shrewd man, a man who didn't care about others. No moral standard. When he saw suffering, it didn't move him. When he saw injustice, his heart remained cold. He didn't fear God. He didn't respect man. 
And then we have a widow. Now, a widow in Jesus' day was not like a widow today, unless she had someone to help her, uh, uh, a brother, a son, you know, of the like. She remained helpless. W- there was no welfare. There was no widow's benefit. There was none of that. She was alone. And so widows made easy targets. People uh, uh, would rob the widow because she was helpless. They would take advantage of the widow and treat them with no regard. And this is now shaping up to be quite an epic showdown. We have the widow, helpless, needs help. She's being oppressed. And we have the shrewd, evil judge. What's going to happen? So the widow goes to seek the judge's justice. Give me justice against my adversary, judge. That's your job. The judge didn't care. Nah, get out of here. Not interested. I'm not here to fix your personal problems, woman. Go away. Again and again and again, she kept going to the judge. Give me justice. And again and again, he would sweep her request under the carpet. Get out of my courtroom. I'm not giving you justice. Not my problem. But she persisted, and eventually the judge just became annoyed with her. Man, she keeps coming and banging on my door. I'm just getting annoyed. He thought, I don't fear God. I don't care about this widow at all. But she's just so annoying. I'll just give her what she wants so she stops bothering me. That was his way of thinking. And so he did. The judge, though a wicked man, gave her justice. Why? Because she persisted. Now, this has some serious modern parallels. Politicians aren't known as the most honest people, are they? Anybody a politician here that I just offended? No? Okay. They're not typically the most honest of people. So how do we get justice in society? How do we change things for the oppressed? Well, we just annoy the leaders until they do something. Take slavery, for example. For a long time, America struggled through the slavery debate. African slaves were being treated with contempt, abused, ripped from their families. Mothers and fathers and children were being sold and and families were being split up. It was incredibly unpopular in that day to oppose slavery. Today it's like, well, of course you oppose slavery, it's evil. But in that day, it was unpopular to oppose it. People would say, well, if you don't like slavery, don't have a slave. People would say, well, it's my plantation, so it's my business. People would say, well, they're not even really fully human, so, you know, there's that. Do those arguments sound familiar to you? Oh, well, it's my body, so it's my choice. Well, it's just a clump of cells. Well, it's not really a human, is it? Yet, slavery is illegal now, isn't it? It's unthinkable, isn't it? To even suggest that slavery was a good thing is enough to get you socially outcasted. And, and good, it should be that way. So how did a bunch of wicked politicians go from saying slavery's good to no, no, slavery's bad? What happened? What changed? This is what happened. The abolitionists hit the streets. They protested. They bothered the authorities. They showed them what was happening. And they got so annoyed that eventually the wicked man gave justice to the people. Now, if wicked men do that, how much more will God do that? Jesus says, pray, don't lose heart. Look, even if the unrighteous will give justice, what about God? God is righteous. He will bring justice. And we're living in perilous times, and justice surrounds us. It's easy to lose heart. It's easy to look at injustice uh, perpetrated against Christians and, and others and think, there's no hope. It's easy to think that. But Jesus tells us in this that we should pray the more. Don't lose heart. Some will say, why are you hanging on to your faith in God? Why are you hanging on to that? I understand the frustrations, because when you look around and you see injustice flourishing and sin abounding, why trust in God? Why have faith? It doesn't seem to be working. These are the questions we all struggle with, and Jesus tells us in this parable to illustrate, just keep pushing, keep going, don't lose heart, pray. And when I say keep pushing, I don't mean work harder as if your work is going to, you know, impress God. No. Surrender. Surrender to Him. Trust God. Throw yourself on His mercy. Don't give up. Surrender to God and pray. Don't lose heart. Look even at the wicked leaders, even when they give justice to people who bother them enough. Injustice may be reigning now around us, but your hope 
if it's in Christ, is not in the world anyways. Our hope is not in the government. Our hope is not in, in, in the leaders of the land. Our hope is in the government of heaven. Our hope is in the king that sits there enthroned, who says, I'm the king of kings. So pray. Pray and don't lose heart. He died to give us eternal hope. He died to figure... Did, did Jesus die on the cross so we could be distressed, so that we could fear? No, of course not. That would make no sense. He died so that we would have hope. His throne is the throne of justice and grace. So trust him. He is coming soon. He's our only hope. And what else are you going to trust in anyways? You're going to keep trusting in the, the, the government leaders? Yeah, you should laugh. That's hilarious. That suggestion is hilarious because we can't put our trust in men. We can't put our trust in women. We have to put our trust in God because he is the only one worthy. Verse uh, 6 here, continuing on in the parable, he says, And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? It is interesting that Jesus uses the example of an unrighteous judge to magnify and illustrate the justness of God. Here now, Jesus says, hear the unrighteous judge. He is unrighteous. There's no doubt about that. Why would Jesus want us to hear him? Have you thought about that? Why would he want us to listen to him? To learn a lesson. And this is the lesson. If the unrighteous judge, hateful, proud, can dish out justice, even with selfish motives, how much more will God? Jesus says, listen to him. Listen to him because in him you see something of God. You see how magnified God is because even the evil man can do just things. Why don't you trust God? Listen to him. Will God who is just and always who does the good and right thing, will this holy and righteous God who makes purity look like filth, the God who makes the brightest angel look like darkness, will he delay justice? Will he? Will he withhold justice from his elect? When we look at God through the lens of the unrighteous judge, the answer is no, he won't. He won't. If the sinful judge does what is right, you better believe the holy God of heaven will do what is right. You better believe he will do justice for his people. And not only will he do justice, Jesus said he's going to do it speedily, quickly. All the brothers and sisters throughout history who have been persecuted and faced trials will be avenged. Our precious brothers who've, who, were, who were beheaded by ISIS by the sea a few years ago, they will be avenged. And it's not a human vengeance. It's God's vengeance. God says, vengeance is mine. It's not yours. It's not for you to take vengeance. That's not your, your job. God says, it's my job, and I will do it. And he'll do it better than you anyways. It's a fearful thing to think about the justice of God against those who persecute his people. I want to read uh, a scripture here in Psalm chapter 7 uh, and hear what God says about his justice that he's stored up. He says, if a man does not repent... God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. God is preparing his justice. And when it comes, it won't be long before his justice utterly pulverizes every single person who has offended his holy name. And as I read that passage, and whenever I read that passage, some of us might cringe, but I actually receive great comfort from it. Because I know God is for me, and I know he died for me, and that he rose from the dead, and that no matter what comes against me, I ought to not lose heart, but to pray. Because God's mercy is on me. In the surety of his justice, I looked up that word, by the way, surety, it is a word. The surety of his justice is my hope. So don't lose heart, pray. Now, look, some of you might be sitting there thinking, boy, Alan, that's kind of harsh. Like, settle down a bit. That's kind of harsh, isn't it? 
How do you find hope in that? Let me use an example of Israel. Israel was in bondage. They were slaves in Egypt, right? You all remember the story. Daily, they were oppressed with burdens they could not bear. Pharaoh, the ancient president, if you would, of Egypt, uh, Egypt's uh, Planned Parenthood wing, even decreed that every male born of the Israelites should be killed. That's what he said. Kill all the males. So here's the people who had their babies ripped from them and killed, forced to work, beaten all day, steeped in suffering, and it's in this context that God appears to Moses, and he says this, Behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you the Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God heard their cry. He heard them. He seen the suffering. And you know what he was doing in heaven? He was wetting his sword. He was bending his bow. And he had the heart of Egypt in his crosshairs. And God doesn't miss. We know the devastation that God brought upon Egypt. He sent the plague after plague after plague. And finally, God went through the whole country. And he said, if you won't let my people go, I will do what you've done to their children. I'm going to kill the firstborn in every house. Brothers and sisters, hear what the unrighteous judge says. Now, will not God swiftly bring justice for his elect? He has and he will. And in this we take comfort because vengeance is God's and he will repay. God loves you. He says you're my bride. And the abuse afflicted on his bride will not go unpunished. You might think I'm speaking harshly, but what if somebody was abusing your wife? Is it harsh now or is it justice now? Either the justice of God will be poured out on Christ or poured out on you. You see, the, un, uh, the, uh, the unbelievable good news of the gospel is this. God has wet his sword. He has bent his bow and he's aimed it at you and he's released it. But Jesus stepped in front of it and he took that shot for you. That's good news. He took the shot for you. He took the sword for you. He did it for you. Those who believe, the arrow of God's justice has pierced the Son of God, and not them. But for those who reject God, the arrow is still bent, and God will hit his target. Jesus died and rose from the dead, and he did this for us. So, don't lose hearts in suffering. You might be suffering now. You might be going through difficulty now. But don't lose heart. God's on your side. And that's a pretty good, he has a good win ratio. Let me put it that way. <laughs> 100%. 100%. Don't lose heart. Hazakim is a Christian rap duo. If you don't know what Christian rap is, uh, are you even saved? I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, need, you need to hear it because it's, it's, it's good. So Hazakim says this in, their, in one of their songs. That he said, they say, the first time he came as a servant, lowly riding on a mule. The second time he comes in judgment, setting up his earthly rule. Jesus finishes his parable by asking, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's the question, isn't it? When he comes, will he find faith in you? Or will the cares of this life and the hardships of earth, will they make you lose heart and give up? I'm not one of these self-help teachers. <laughs> You've probably discovered that by now. I'm not one of these self-help teachers. Uh, I'm not trying to suggest you need to try harder because I think self-help is garbage. It will not help you in the midst of a war. What's going to help you is if you have God Almighty going before you. That's what's going to help you in the war. It's going to help you when things are nice, right? But when things get hard, trust me, I was into self-help. I, I read all the books, man. I read them all. Think and Grow Rich. Name it. I read them. What's that? Um, I never got into him. I never got into him. I read most of them, put it that way. And when life got hard, it didn't work. When I was depressed, it didn't work. I couldn't just muster up good feelings. It's not how it works. 
You don't need more of yourself. I say this every week. You don't need more of yourself. You need more of, of God. And I'm just imitating what the Lord says. It may not be popular, but it's true. Don't lose heart. Pray. 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 Go to the Lord. When I was in difficulty, I never prayed more. And that's to my shame. Because why do I only pray when it's difficult? But we need to pray always and not lose heart. We will face trials. We will face hard times. So we pray. Why does Jesus say pray? He knows something. It presupposes something. We're weak. If we could do it ourselves, there's no need to pray. But he says, I know you're going to lose heart. I see it on your face. I just told you all this stuff. You're losing heart already. Don't. Pray. Pray. And here's the thing. More effort will never equal more God because nothing you do can earn him in your life. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. No, that's a different song. Sorry. He paid it all. That's what I'm saying. He made a way for us to know God. I mean... Case closed. What more can be said? Don't lose hearts. Pray. Pray because he hears you. Pray and believe. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your love to us. We thank you that you're on our side, that you love us as a bride, that you love us as your own, and that you went to the cross, Lord Jesus, that we might know you, that we might be free from our chains of sin that we might live in righteousness, and that we may truly know what it is to love truly um, with, a, with a God love, a love that transcends um, all that we think love is, a love that transcends ethnicity, that transcends language, that transcends race, that transcends um, gender, a love that a love that is stronger than the grave. Thank you for overcoming, Lord. And we just follow you and ask, have mercy on us, hear our prayers, and give us a heart of strength. In Jesus' name, amen.